Hello everyone, my name is Nick Khan. I'm the National Executive Officer for Wine Communicators of Australia and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, our second for the month of May, to take advantage of our international presenter being here in Adelaide. Kate Hardy lives in California these days but she's an Australian by birth and you know that she has wine in her pedigree when I point out her surname and tell you that her father's name is Bill. Kate is a US attorney and a partner with the firm of Strike and Teckle in San Francisco. She specialises in wine and other lesser beverages uh, and knows all about the laws that cover wine marketing in the US including how they apply to social media. It's an interesting issue and one that begs the question how can you have country specific restrictions on a kind of media that by its very nature is open and global. Kate will talk about that question and then look specifically at the US where social media is a very large part of the wine marketing scene and where I'm sure many Australian wine businesses would like their social media activity to have resonance. But first, to put things in context, we've asked James Omond in Melbourne to provide an overview of the laws as they apply in Australia for alcohol, alcohol marketing, including for social media advertising. Many of you would uh, know James. He's the Honorary Counsel for WCA, for which we are very grateful, as well as Sennelier's Australia and a board member of both the Winemakers Federation and Wine Victoria. In his spare time, as he puts it, he tries to do some paid work. He's been a lawyer in the wine industry since 1994 and for the last 13 years has run his own firm, Omont & Co. But before introducing James, I just need to do two things. The first is to tell you that today's webinar is brought to you jointly by WCA and the Australian Grape and Wine Authority, with whom we work on four or five webinars each year. Today's ties in with some current research being funded by AGWA, looking at to what extent a wine brand's approach to social media use affects the consumer response to that brand and uh, we'll let you know the results of that research when they come to hand. We in turn with AGWA and others run a comprehensive series of webinars throughout the year which is part of our expanding role at WCA of being a communications conduit for the industry and I'll talk about our next webinar at the end of today's. The second thing I have to remind you is that webinars can be interactive sessions for all who wish to join in as well as listen in. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment during the presentations, you have three options as set out on the screen now. You can use the comment box, you can tweet or you can email. Jen Barwick, WCA's program manager, is here with us and will moderate your input, reply directly as appropriate and send as many questions as possible through to the presenters and to me. If we don't get to your question in the next hour, we will get back to you later and we will send all of you a link to access a recording of the session in your own time uh, after this session. Now James is the opening proceedings but he'll be staying with us throughout and so we'll be taking questions for either James or Kate and if time allows at the end of the, the, end of the session we can just have a free for all. Um, one last thing before I uh, throw to James, we've got a couple of polls during the session. The first one, a fairly straightforward one, we'd like to get an idea of how many of you are advertising or promoting your wine in the US. So please uh, log your answers. We'll come back to that and analyse it in a moment. But for now, enough of me. Let's look at hashtag wine rules and I'll introduce James Omon to look at the Australian setting. James? Thanks very much, Nick. Okay, well, the, um, it's a bit of a, I wouldn't say a Wild West situation in Australia, but uh, I think Kate, uh, on the one hand, it's probably a bit envious of the, the lack of regulation around um, advertising, particularly digital advertising in Australia. But I think from the point of view of making budget each month, she's probably happy that the, the US is a little bit more restrictive than us. Um, the main area that, uh, that wine producers need to be mindful of is the Alcohol Beverages Advertising Code, um, which uh, for anyone who's sort of been familiar with it in the past, uh, if you haven't checked in the last 12 months, you, you probably need to go back and have another look because the code was revamped um, in July, or starting in July last year, and there was there was certainly a, a few um, presentations run around the country on those changes. Um, given that this session today is about the US rather than Australia. I'm not going to go into that in any particular detail other than to say that um, the, the code sort of has made it very clear that um, the coverage does extend to digital marketing nowadays on, on social media platforms. Um, although there was an interesting decision to do with some Jägermeister um, 
uh, Facebook ads just uh, in the last couple of months where the, um, the adjudication panel made it clear that, that it's not the placement where, the, where an alcohol advertisement is placed, it's not the medium that's, that's relevant, um, it's whether um, the content of it is a breach of the code provisions. So in that case, um, the, the advertiser didn't use any um, age gateway technology to restrict access to the, um, to the advertisement, but that wasn't found to be a breach of the code. Um, there were three ads in, in particular that were complained about. Two of them were not, uh, the complaints weren't upheld, but the third one was upheld, but that was because of the content of the ad rather than the fact that it was on Facebook and able to be accessed by under 18s. Um, one of the things to note, I guess, as well is that sponsorship is not covered by the code, but in case people get excited and think that that means that they're, they're um, home free with sponsorship stuff, any supporting marketing collateral is covered. Um, so you do need to be careful if you think that that's uh, uh, like just because you, it's a sponsorship rather than some other form of advertising that, that you're not covered. Um, and the other um, change to, to, to be aware of is that the code now makes it clear that it applies, applies to producers, retailers and distributors. Uh, James, the four are key elements... From, uh, James, are you confident from your reading of the revised Act that it is sufficiently sensitive to, to social media and its specific requirements? Uh, yeah, it is, and even under the, the former provisions, um, there were still decisions handed down by the adjudication panel that um, found that advertising material on social media was actually covered. Um, the, some of the, the difficulties come up um, where it's not the company itself running the Facebook page. So um, another decision that was just in April this year involved a, a case up in um, uh, King's Cross, the Soho Bar, um, and it was one where I've got, I forgot anyone from Pernod Ricard uh, on the line, but they sort of got dragged into it um, through the, the complaint process. The, the, um, the, the bar in question, Soho, was um, throwing, a, you know, having a, a, a special um, promotion that night. Um, I think actually I shouldn't say. I've just got to remember now but whether it was the the Soho one or another one that Perno was 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 dragged into. In in either case, um, that the wine company was found not to be responsible for the breach of um, of the code because they had nothing to do with it other than um, they you know were were providing some um, some support uh, for the the products that were on offer that night, but they had nothing to do with the with the promotion. But the fact that um, there is a promotion on um, Facebook by, say, a bar, so that they fall under the case, the, the, the definition of a retailer, means that it does come within the code. I guess the one thing to, to bear in mind with the code is that it, it's referred to as being quasi-regulatory, uh, which means it doesn't have the force of law. Uh, it's it's a, an industry-funded, industry-run, uh, voluntary code, which is one of the things that the, um, the anti-alcohol lobby um, thinks it's not uh, the best way to go in the interest of society, um, because if you're not a signatory to it, then technically you're not bound by it. Um, now, uh, the, the, the main um, industry bodies like the Winemakers Federation, the, the Brewers Association, the Distilled Spirits Council, as well as the two chains are all signatories to it. Um, so they have agreed you know, on behalf of their members to be bound, but there certainly have been cases in the past where uh, producers who either aren't a, a member of the industry body or who um, choose not to be uh, bound by the code have simply ignored um, uh, complaints that have been upheld against them. So, a complicated area, yeah, in other words. Yeah, I think 
it, it's one of those areas where um, not too many um, people, particularly in the wine industry, do get caught up in it. It's it's often more, um, you know, without wanting to to sort of cast aspersions, um, beer and spirits producers who uh, have uh, the, the sort of promotions that are caught up in this. Um, needless to say, if you are if you if you are are uh, the subject of a complaint. Um, it does need to be taken seriously, and even if you take the view that you're not um, bound by the decision, the problem then becomes one of um, risk management for reputation, because uh, you can cop. You're likely to cop a lot more heat and a lot more adverse publicity um, through not uh, complying with a decision that's handed down, and and thinking that you can ignore it and if you've been involved in advertising something and promoting something in the first place, then presumably you are interested in you know how your brand is perceived in the market, um, and you, you're really opening yourself up to um, significant downside by by taking the view of I'm not bound by it. Sounds like an area we'll have to explore in a, in a future webinar. Um, you, we've got the four key elements to the ABAC uh, on the screen there. James, can you take us through them briefly? Yep. So, I think the first one is um, is fairly self-explanatory, responsible and moderate portrayal of, of beverages. So, not encouraging um, uh, excessive consumption, etc. And and that's that's been one that there's been quite a few complaints made, um, and a lot of them haven't been upheld. So, for example. Uh, before the new code came in and then since it's come in there've been complaints where there's been a promotion you know if you buy you know buy six get one free or um, you know discounts for for if you're selling a case uh, I have to say a lot of the complaints that are made are uh, made on a um, confidential uh, anonymous basis and some might say are um, I want to say shit stirring, but I should use something that's quite a bit more polite than that. Um, but that's certainly not been upheld. You know, if you're running a promotion that, that encourages purchase of a case of wine, it's it's uh, ABAC have said you know that's a perfectly legitimate um, response. Um, responsibility towards minors is probably one of the ones where there was the biggest change in the substance of the code last year because it had been an area of the, the most criticism in the past. Um, and there's certainly more detail in the code now than previously, but as I say, this is not about Australia, so I won't go into that. Um, responsible depiction of the, the effects of alcohol, again, sort of self-explanatory, like the first one, and likewise, alcohol and safety. Um, what I would like to do is move on to the next um, slide, because that's probably more relevant for the topic of today's um, conversation. Whoops, no, not that one. I'll go back. Um, so ABAC have released a, a, um, it's a, a, a five-page guide to uh, like a best practice for responsible marketing of alcoholic beverages in digital in the digital space. Uh, and the, you see from the bullet points there, the four key elements are interaction with other regulations. So there are um, other regulations like the. Australian Association of National Advertisers have a code of ethics. Um, Communications Council has guidelines. There's, um, if you're engaging in two-way um, uh, engagement with consumers, then you've got the privacy laws that govern the collection of personal information. Um, and you know, there's always the you know the misleading and deceptive conduct provisions. Um, there's recommendation to include responsible drinking message and link through to a responsible drinking website. Um, the age affirmation one is probably the, the key that, that most people are sort of asking about when they're looking into this for the first time. Like, is it compulsory to have um, some sort of an age gateway on your alcohol advertising? And um, as I say, the ABAC code is, is voluntary, so there's no uh, requirement to have that, and as I mentioned at the top of the session with the, the Jägermeister case, um, due to a uh, 
user error by the advertiser. They didn't put that um, gateway on, but that wasn't found to be a breach. Um, but there's, in terms of the age restriction, there's quite a, a lengthy series of recommendations as to how you should handle this, including um, uh, notices that should be included um, where there's possibility for for um, participants and respondents to, to do to engage in sharing with their with their Facebook friends or whatever through through shares or downloads or forwarding emails. So they they recommend that you know they should advise uh, people not to do that to uh, in any way that could expose the message to uh, to minors. Um, things like including a nanny tag um, on your websites to describe the content in a way that parental control software can detect it. Um, there's a few different uh, suggestions there uh, how to, how to uh, ensure that you're um, following best practice. You know, proximity marketing, um, downloadable applications, what, what sort of uh, precautions you should take with those. Uh, and then the last one is with user-generated content. Um, there's confirmation that uh, that this is within the scope of ABEC, ABEC, um, and so it's suggesting that you, know, you should have a, once again the affirmation of date of birth um, and you know, what country you're in, so you can establish that whether it's you know 18 or or a different age group to um, to be able to participate, and then suggestions to have uh, moderation of user-generated content as well, either pre-moderation or post-moderation. Um, and also suggesting um, house rules as to, to what's acceptable and what's not. And, and it provides a, a set of sample house rules at the end of that, um, that document. A couple of other quick points before I um, hand over to Kate. The, uh, the issues of infringement um, is one that, that comes up a lot. So um, on Facebook, for example, if someone else is Using your trademark, um, you might uh, the Facebook have complaints procedure you can follow, but some people find it a little bit um, complicated because you've actually got to work out is it a trademark issue or is it um, a copyright issue? For example, if there's um, content such as logos um, or or uh, or written content that's on your site, um, you need to work out which one of those you're going to 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 go down that route and then work out. Um, exactly what your ownership rights are that you're asserting on those. Uh, and that applies the other way. If you're looking to use someone else's content um, as part of your um, promotion, whether it's on Facebook or someone else, you need to, to think clearly through, do you have the right to use that? And the same thing with um, Google AdWords. Um, if you're wanting to put in, um, in your metadata or some other way of, of driving content, um, there's certainly been a few cases um, in the last couple of years about you know, to what extent you're able to do that uh, and to what extent you're not. So, uh, sorry, then, then just before we, we finish up, obviously with your website and any other um, online um, content you've got, if you're doing any sort of selling through that, then you need to have your liquor license number and um, each state has a slightly different prescribed statement that you need to include. Uh, and my recommendation is to have that as part of your website template. So it doesn't matter which page um, people are on, whether it's the purchase page or other um, in just pure information, I think it's always a good idea to have that um, somewhere on, on your website template. Um, and obviously sales to minors, um, you know, we were talking before about under ABAC um, not uh, promoting to minors or um, being careful the message that, that's being put across. Um, the, um, the sale to minors through a website, there's no, the law is not really any different to um, if a 16 or 17 year old walks into a bottle shop looking to buy it, it's obviously it's, uh, prohibited the sale there. Um, so you need to sort of think through the way that occurs through your website, but then also um, restrictions with the fulfilment of orders 
to make sure that the, um, whether it's Australia Post or someone else, that you have strict instructions about um, that comply with the relevant state laws about um, how that's done to ensure RSA is complied with. Um, and then just those last two comments, um, the, the standard sort of legal warning that just because it's easy to uh, to copy someone else's content, whether it's a stock photo online or or uh, some um, some wording or descriptions that you think sounds really nice, or even nowadays with um, with wine reviews by um, the the prominent wine writers. Um, there's a lot of restriction around what you can and can't do um, without um, uh, some sort of a commercial arrangement and a license with them to, to reproduce your wine reviews. James, thanks for that. As I, um, as I throw across the Kate, I might do two things. One is to get Jane to bring up the, uh, the poll results on uh, who is advertising or promoting their wine in the US. But also the first thing I might say to Kate is, do you have a comment on what James has just been through and, and whether any of the changes... That he implied at the start that it's a lot easier here than in the US. Is that the case? Well, it's interesting, actually, because a lot of the situation in the US is, is similar. We deal mainly with voluntary codes. They're industry-based rather than being a single alcoholic beverage code that like we have here in Australia. Uh, in, the, in the US, there's a wine institute code, there's a discus code for the spirits industry, and there's a beer institute code. So I'll be coming back to that. And it contains a lot of the same provisions that you see in, in ABAC here. We have the added complication of having some additional regulations and, and laws affecting the advertising of alcohol generally. But in fact, there's a, a lot more similarity than, than certainly I had expected. I hadn't seen the new ABAC provisions since they came in in July last year. Uh, so that's certainly very helpful to see that. Okay, well please take us through the US story. As you do, we'll look at the poll results which shows about 27% yes, 27% thinking about it, 45% no. So we've got a bit of an even split. It'll uh, be interesting to know why, but um, please tell us about the US situation, okay? So, um, you know, it's interesting obviously because any of the wineries out here who are doing any marketing which is extending into the US, obviously anybody working here in Australia is outside the jurisdiction of any of the US authorities, which leaves you in somewhat of a grey area when you're talking about marketing to customers in the US, to consumers in the US. Um, but it's, it's something that, you know, you certainly want to be careful about obeying the same types of laws that any of the US producers are, are bound by. Uh, so I wanted to just kind of start with a very short history lesson, um, just talking a little bit about prohibition simply because it affects everything that anybody working in the alcohol industry does in the US today. Uh, most of the laws and regulations that affect the industry were written back in the 1930s when prohibition ended. Uh, prohibition also really removed the regulation of alcohol from a federal level and handed it out to the states. So most of the regulations that we deal with today tend to be run at a state level. Most of the authorities, most of the, uh, the you know, people looking at activities of anybody in the alcohol industry is going to be at the state, state regulation level. Uh, so it's something where, you know, prohibition has informed the laws that we deal with today. Uh, they haven't kept pace. It's something we'll come back to a bit with the social media. Uh, one of the issues that I was telling Nick earlier that, that I dealt with a couple of years ago was a client wanting to want to run a Twitter promotion uh, that was having to deal with a state law preventing communication by telegraph uh, communication, so any kind of advertising by telegraph. And we were left in the position of trying to work out whether Twitter uh, was a telegraph communication or not. Uh, so we deal with what we generally refer to as both tied house and trade practice regulations, which affect any type of advertising and promotion in the US. And that's going to extend from advertising, whether it's social media advertising or whether it's general advertising, to any other kind of promotions, any dealings with your wholesaler and retailer and importer customers in the US. Uh, so I think that's, that's something that, that I just wanted to go through a bit uh, on the next few slides. One of the main things to remember when doing any kind of marketing and promotions in the US is that there's a general prohibition on giving anything of value to somebody in one of the other tiers of the industry. So after prohibition, we ended up with 
mainly a three-tier industry. Most states have three tiers where you have producers and importers on the top tier, you have wholesalers or distributors on the second tier, and then you have your retailers on the third tier. And a lot of the regulations and the laws that we deal with actually don't extend so much to a winery's relationship with consumers, but they mainly affect a winery's relationship with its customers in the other tiers of the industry. And this is where this general prohibition comes in on giving anything of value to somebody in another tier of the industry. So a winery is generally prevented from giving anything of value either to a wholesaler or to a retailer. And in practice, the way that that's worked is that there have been a number of exceptions which have been created to this prohibition on giving things of value. So it comes back to similar, similar sorts of promotion to what you do here in Australia. So you can give people point of sale advertising within certain limits. Uh, you can give them consumer and retailer advertising specialties. You can give wine lists. You can give product displays. These are all going to vary state by state. Uh, this is something that we do a bit in our practice, is actually doing what we call 50 state surveys of having to go through every single state in the US and look at the very slight differences that they often have, or quite large differences in some cases, uh, on, on what you can and can't do state by state. Uh, but one of these things of value that's come up and that's come up more and more in recent years is advertising. And that's where we come back to this idea of your advertising and particularly your social media advertising. A lot of the regulation that we're seeing today is around suppliers promoting retailers. So it's actually, you know, go and get a cocktail, go and get a glass of our wine at such and such retailer. Uh, and putting that on your Facebook feed, putting that in your social media. Uh, that's something where we're seeing more laws pop up around the US that restrict that. Um, and are people noticing the impact of that? Is it restricting the things that they're trying to do, what they consider to be legitimate marketing activities? It certainly is, and it's, it's something that's very difficult because I think we're seeing more and more people coming into the alcohol industry from other industries. And alcohol being sold as a commodity alongside other commodities, it's moving more into the grocery store channels, it's moving more into the chains. And so you get marketing people who are used to having you know, expansive abilities to market and to advertise who are suddenly being caught up in these restrictions where you know, it's not as easy to say, go and pick up a case of our wine at you know, Trader Joe's or wherever it might be, whatever retailer that you're working with. So that's something where you know, it's been and interesting to navigate. It's particularly difficult for those offshore in Australia who don't have the ability to do a Facebook from here saying, hey, go and have a free glass of our wine in Jimmy's bar in New York, because you, which you think you can do from your own Facebook page. But yeah. Well, exactly, and it's, and it's something where, you know, a winery in Australia, if you've got a US customer who's coming to your Facebook page, who's coming to wherever, the main thing that you want to communicate to them is, go and try our product. Here's where you can get it. Here's what you can do. And that's, that's where a lot of these restrictions have come up in, in recent years. I'll come back to that in a couple of slides. Uh, I just had a quick slide on, this is still in the same vein of giving anything of value to your wholesaler and retailer customers. One of the restrictions that we have is about uh, commercial bribery and giving sales incentives to any of your wholesaler and retailer customers. And that comes back in some senses to the advertising as well because it's still you know, we'll promote you if you promote us. You can have these types of deals where you're trying to incentivize people who are selling your product in the US to actually co-promote and advertise with you. And um, that's, that's something that's, that's certainly become more, more restricted. A question just come in, Kate, from Emily. Um, so how does this impact, say, adding a map to retail outlets in the US on our website? Is that okay? It's actually, we can move on to the next slide, I think. That, touches more directly on this idea of retail mentions. And it's, it's a good question. It's something that, that, that has come up, especially in California. In most states around the US and at the federal level, it's fine to tell people what retailers are selling your product. So you can have a list on your website. Uh, you can you know, promote retailers that are selling your product. As long as you obey this strange rule that they have, which says that you can talk about retailers as long as you mention at least two retailers that aren't connected to each other. So not you know, two members of the same chain of restaurants or not two of the same hotel. It has to be two different unrelated retailers. And as long as, as, long as you do that, you're, you're fine across most of the US. The, the rationale being? The rationale being, I think, that a lot of the prohibition around advertising retailers is that they don't want supply driving business to a particular okay. retailer. So that's where 
you know, they try and restrict you actually promoting to people to go to a retailer and purchase your product, which is obviously what you want to do for marketing purposes. So you, you come up with that dichotomy where you, you can't quite work out what you can do. California is the exception to the rule. California, which is generally a very open state for the promotion of alcohol, uh, has its own unusual rule about mentioning retailers where you can only talk about what retailers sell your products in California on a direct inquiry from a customer. Thankfully, the way that the state has interpreted it has been fairly liberal, not requiring a customer to have to send you an email, but allowing exactly what Emily mentioned in her question, that you can have a page on your website as long as you hide it behind a link. So if the consumer goes to your website and clicks a link that says, where can I buy your product? That's considered by California to be a direct inquiry. That's the customer making a request for that information to actually click through and find out where they can buy your products. So generally speaking, it's fine to have that list on your website, to have the list of your wholesalers for your retail customers, and to have a list of retailers for your consumers, so for people in the street to know where they can actually go and try your products. The only thing is just hiding it behind a link on the website. Uh, as, bizarre as, as bizarre as that may sound, gets you around that restriction. And there's a, there's a little logo up there, which is a case that's currently going through the courts in California at the moment. There was a charity wine tasting last year uh, in California, in Sacramento, which was sponsored by a group called Save Mart Supermarkets, uh, called the Save Mart Grape Escape. Uh, and it was a uh, charity event in California, as in many states across the U.S., the winery is allowed to come to the event and pour wine, uh, uh, actually have a stand where customers can come and try your wines. And so all of the wineries that participated in the event were encouraged by the organizers to tweet out information about the event, to tell their fans that they were going to be pouring at the event. Uh, and because they did that, eight wineries actually got sued by the Liquor Authority in California for their tweets because they mentioned the retailer's name, because it had Save Mart right in the tweet that was considered to be retailer advertising. And so we've got eight wineries who were prosecuted by the Liquor Authority in California for that tweet uh, with that information in it. It was a retweet even, I think. It was a retweet from the organizers that, that was put through uh, by the wineries. Uh, and interestingly, at the moment, one of the wineries has actually challenged it. Seven of them accepted a one-year probation uh, and a 10-day suspended sentence. But one winery is actually challenging it on very typically American free speech uh, is the defense that they're going with. They're, they're pleading the first amendment, first, first or the second, one of those amendments, uh, whichever one the free speech one is. One the other. Exactly. I mean, I guess to put that in an Australian context, if one of those eight wineries had been an Australian winery, for yes. example, mm -hmm. um, would they have been treated the same? Would it be likely that action would have been taken against an Australian winery as well? It's going to be interesting to see how they would have dealt with that. Because of the jurisdiction issue, it's not like the Liquor Authority in California could actually attack an Australian winery for the same type of promotion. But what is interesting, and I think what we're seeing more and more, is people actually looking at foreign uh, suppliers through their importers, so through their locally licensed importers. So it wouldn't necessarily have been the Australian winery that would have had any trouble with it, but the importer who was actually bringing in those wines could potentially have been penalised for the winery's actions. Okay. So I assume importers therefore looking at this case quite closely because yes. it would have implications. It does, exactly. And it's something where, you know, I think generally, and it's something that I've talked about with Wine Australia a bit, uh, well, Agua obviously a bit uh, over the years in terms of promotions in the US, is that, you know, foreign wineries do have a nice grey area where you're kind of outside the jurisdiction of the liquor authorities in the US. But it's something where I think we're seeing the states more and more trying to reel foreign suppliers in, and that's largely because the domestic suppliers are complaining about it. You know, if you have a foreign winery doing something that a local winery can't. So Cutting it, related to that issue, Ben asks several distributors, he mentions Negotiants USA, um, have social media accounts, are these accounts able to promote wines to consumers? Well, they certainly are, and the, the distributors can promote it, but it's still subject to these same restrictions around mentioning retailers. So that's, that's largely the, the concern, and that's, you know, it's, it's something that we see a lot of, of people wanting to promote especially a special cocktail or 
wine by the glass on somebody's wine list. Uh, it's something that the distributors particularly fight very hard to get a wine into the wine by the glass program. So it's something that they want to promote. But I think this, particularly the Save Mart case, is something that everybody's watching very closely mm -hmm. at the moment. And you know, one of the other arguments that they that they're making in the case is it's just not. They talk about it being proportional to what they're trying to attack. So they're trying to prevent people being driven into a particular retailer, but is preventing someone from tweeting the name of a retailer, is that actually achieving that goal is going to be where the, where the fight seems to be happening at the yeah. moment. Sorry, just moving on to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to mention a few of the recent trade practice inv investigations that we've had in the US, and these aren't so much around advertising as uh, they are. A lot of them tend to be around shelf space. It comes back to the same restrictions about giving anything of value, so a lot of it is informative in terms of social media, and I'll just mention it very quickly because I think coming back to the social media is going to be, is going to be more helpful. Um, these all, in New York, we had consent orders where uh, there were, in the New York industry, they found $19 million worth of illegal bribes effectively going from suppliers to retailers. Uh, and we had suppliers through retailers all penalized by the state uh, for participating in, in all of the, the trade practices, some of it being advertising, some of it being promotion, uh, but a lot of it being basically paying to get behind, behind the bar, uh, which was similar to the other cases that I've mentioned there. Uh, we had one in Chicago where people were advertising to actually get bottles on shelves, uh, and in Las Vegas in the casinos, the same type of thing where we had the, the well drinks. Uh, coming back to the advertising rules uh, on the next one, um, in the US, the drinking age is 21, which seems surprising, I think, certainly to younger people in Australia that didn't, didn't live through that uh, before the, the drinking age came back to 18. Um, in the US, it, was, it went the reverse. It was 18 for many years and got, got switched to 21 uh, by the federal government at the time, pressured the states uh, into changing to the 21 age limit. And it creates you know, some distinct issues from what we see in Australia, although interestingly, uh, the codes that we'll come back to in a moment actually have the same provision that you have here in ABAC, where models have to appear at least 25. Uh, so even though the age limit is different, we still have that same 25 restriction uh, that we have uh, in, in Australia. And that's always been an interesting one. You and I were talking about it earlier, and, and I know from my own involvement with ABAC, and, and James would probably know this, that the, the restriction on 25, whether you agree with it or not, seemed reasonably easy to deal with when you were hiring models to be in a prepared advertisement. But there's a lot of social media-based advertising, which is around competition winners where legitimate winners of 19 can't be promoted because they look less than 25. And I know not so much in the wine industry, but in the beer and spirits industry, that's become quite a big issue. Is it in America? It is. It's certainly something where there's a real consciousness around the 21 age limit. And, uh, you know, it's something particularly with the college campuses because there is this real trend in the U.S. for people going to college, so people starting their tertiary education to actually move away from home. And we're talking about 18 and 19 year olds who've always lived at home, always been in their parents' homes, suddenly being on these college campuses. And particularly a lot of the alcohol advertisers are really trying to target those locations. Uh, and so you see a lot of restrictions coming in around the age limits, around the types of advertisements that, that can be used. Um, although not so much on the actual legal level, it comes back to these same voluntary guidelines uh, similar to ABAC, which, which I'll come back to. In terms of the actual federal laws surrounding advertising, uh, the TTB, which is the federal authority, came out a couple of years ago with an advisory about social media, uh, which we've been waiting for for some time uh, to actually see how the federal authority was going to deal with the issue of social media. And basically, the advisory is a couple of pages long, but essentially just says social media is media. It's advertising. It's, it's the same as a newspaper. It's the same as anything. So social media is bound by advertising restrictions in the same way that a newspaper is bound by advertising restrictions. So it's not created, it's not been hugely helpful to anybody actually trying to navigate the laws. Um, but it does, you know, it, I think it certainly helps remind people in the alcohol industry that it's not just, you know, a magazine advertisement that you might place that you have to be careful about. It's, it's as simple as your marketing person sitting at their computer and sending out a tweet or 
putting something on your Facebook page. You know, all of that has to be taken into account uh, when, when, you know, when working on all of your promotional. Uh, yeah, social media is easy to do, but in some ways more complex to make sure you're doing it right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, there are some mandatory pieces of information that have to appear on uh, alcohol advertisements in the US and they're easy enough to implement that if anybody is looking at actually you know, sending more of their advertising into the US market, you know, targeting it more directly, the main thing that has to appear on your advertising is just the name of your importer uh, in the US. So uh, it's as simple as having a short mention at the bottom of any advertisement that indicates who your importer is, who is basically responsible for your advertising. And the way that that works, the one helpful thing that did come out of the federal advisory was to indicate that on a social media platform like Facebook, like Twitter, like Instagram, you can put that information on your home page. It doesn't have to go out in every 40 letter tweet that you send. It can be on your home Twitter page, on your home Facebook page. So that's something that's, that's easy enough to implement, that's likely that Anybody that's doing business in the US already has that information about their importer on there. But that basically ticks the box of the main advertising rules outside of the issue that we talked about already about retailer mentions uh, that, that covers uh, what you need to have on that page. If you're advertising a specific product, you are also required to put the alcohol content on it. So if you have one of your particular brands, uh, that's going on there. That's a slight twist to that rule that you have to have the alcohol content in your ad as well. Uh, but if you're advertising your brand as a whole, uh, you don't need that information. At the state level, there's very little in the way of additional regulation of alcohol. Uh, some of the states, in fact, many of the southern states still have a lot of dry communities. Uh, that's not likely to be an issue for an Australian winery to be concerned about promoting alcohol to the dry communities in the US. Um, but if you are, I know certainly the South Australian government has just announced an initiative to target Texas more, and Texas still has a surprising amount of dry communities there, uh, as do states including in Tennessee, the county where they make Jack Daniels is dry. So <laughs> one of the biggest distilleries in the world, you actually can't buy a bottle of this in the local store. Sometimes we still say only in America. I, I know. <laughs> it's wonderful. I had said that with, to friends when I moved there. It was because there were still places like uh, Footloose where you can't drink and you can't dance. Mm. Okay. Uh, now in terms of the voluntary guidelines that we're dealing with, you know, I won't go into this in a lot of detail because a lot of it's covered in the ABAC information that James gave earlier. Uh, as I indicated when I first started speaking, we do have the three different codes that we deal with uh, and they're per different beverage, so we have a wine institute voluntary guideline, the distilled spirits guideline and the beer institute guideline. Uh, similar to ABAC, unless you're a signatory to it, it doesn't affect you, but they are broadly enough covered in the US markets that most people treat them as basically laws. Uh, it's something that the Federal Trade Commission has looked at more and more in recent years uh, to see whether a, a federal uh, law should be imposed over this, so it's something that the industry has been very careful to try and make uh, as across the board as possible uh, to ensure that people are following it so there aren't actually federal laws that are imposed. Uh, most of what we do with similar to Australia is targeting minors, uh, so anything that's addressed at youth and that's including the rules are specific to mention cartoons and Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny uh, in particular. Uh, seem to be very protected childhood icons that cannot be mentioned in any alcohol advertising. Uh, some of the other ones that are more specific again uh, than the Australian ones, but still along the same lines of responsible consumption, we see uh, restrictions on depicting feats of daring uh, or feats of skill operating a vehicle, uh, anything that suggests that you're going to have achievement or success through drinking alcohol. Uh, and any health claims, and that's a big one in the U.S. The, U the U.S. certainly, uh, dating back to you know the 70s, has been very restrictive about uh, any suggestion that alcohol could in any way be good for you, uh, and that's any type of alcohol, whether it's you know some of the more recognised attributes of wine contributing to health to, to anything else. So anything suggestive of a health claim is is certainly best avoided. Uh, as in Australia, they're voluntary guidelines. They're good to follow, but not necessarily mandatory. It's the same for age gating uh, as, as in Australia. And we have a, 
the responsible statement is really just, as indicated, it's just making sure that your importer's name is, is listed on there as the responsible statement. Uh, there are placement restrictions in the US, so you do want to be careful if you are promoting uh, anything to make sure that you've got around 70% of the audience should be over 21. Uh, and any, any traditional media certainly will be able to provide that information very quickly. And then in terms of social media, you can use each of the social media platforms has ways of ensuring that people reading it are going to be over 21. So um, Facebook requires age. Uh, for every person registered on the website, uh, so it's, it's quite easy to ensure that nobody who's under 21 can access your Facebook page, uh, but it's the same across other social media platforms, um, something, something to be careful with there. Uh, user content, as James mentioned, is something as well that, you know, again, uh, particularly with the development of retweeting and things like that, uh, obviously anybody promoting uh, alcohol, whether it be here in Australia or in the US or anywhere, has to be careful with you know, promoting or even allowing to stay on your website any kind of user content which might go against your internal marketing program. So you want to make sure that you, know, you may well have a whole program of showing responsible uh, drinking of alcohol and then you know, somebody starts posting photos on your Facebook page and tagging you on them with mm -hmm. irresponsible consumption. It needs, needs to be monitored and, and moderated. Uh, I brought a few examples of some of the recent uh, advertising uh, investigations that have happened in the US. Unfortunately, the Wine Institute hasn't had many complaints, A, uh, under their voluntary guidelines. Most of the industry has been very good at, uh, at following that, uh, but they also don't publicize the complaints that they've had. So it's hard to see the ones that, the ones that have actually been problematic. So the examples I've got here are, are spirits and beer ones. Uh, but certainly look to uh, the issues that we've been talking about in the voluntary guidelines. And on that uh, slide that you've got in front of you there, uh, this is a new vodka uh, that's come out from Three Olives, which is called Loopy. Uh, and you may be able to see in the picture the Fruit Loops uh, that appear in the martini glass uh, on the front of this product, uh, which is obviously where the complaints came from, that uh, the vodka was being targeted to children uh, by using a, a child's uh, bre breakfast cereal. Uh, and in fact, in the middle there, you can see one of the things that the Loopy Vodka agreed to remove from their promotions was their BOC cocktail, which is the bowl of cereal cocktail, <laughs> uh, with your Loopy Vodka and your milk, uh, and I presume your coloring to make it look like a Fruit Loop, so a bowl of cereal. Uh, it wasn't actually in the investigation that uh, the Discus uh, third party review body uh, did of the product. They actually didn't sanction them at all. The, uh, the vodka producer actually came back with, with voluntary uh, changes to their website in order to address it. And you can still buy the, the certainly the label was not affected. You can still buy, if you want to, uh, a Fruit Loop flavored vodka. <laughs> Uh, similarly for the adult chocolate milk on the right, uh, this is a, another product where they have a whole range of adult flavored milks. Uh, the producer agreed to remove some cherubs uh, that they had uh, on their advertising and replaced it with this presumably over 25 cartoon nurse that you can see that appears in their, uh, in their advertising now. They also agreed to voluntarily implement an age gate. Uh, on all of their advertising, which, as I said, was, is not, not mandatory, but something that's, that's certainly helpful in, in any of the investigations we've seen. On the left there, we've got a vodka called 50 Blur Vodka. Uh, I've only provided one of the photos because I didn't want to contravene the gratuitous nudity uh, clauses, which they were also sanctioned for. Uh, but as you can see, elegantly wasted in every way with the girl uh, sitting on the ground with her heels on uh, was not considered to be responsible advertising, uh, nor was the other advertisement that the same producer had which said, roses are red, violets are blue, vodka is cheaper than dinner for two, skip dinner, uh, which was also considered to be irresponsible marketing. Uh, on the right there, you've got a brand called Big Al Vodka. That gun is actually the bottle uh, of vodka. So you, I think, squirt it from the front of the gun, much like a, a child's water pistol. Uh, and you can see the gambling and other Al Capone-related uh, information that the, the vodka producer put in there. 
sort of ticks all the boxes. Really it really does, definitely. <laughs> uh, and they were particularly thankful actually for the, for the shot glass in there, which is in the place of the silencer. So somehow, including a silencer, took, a, took having a gun from being relatively apparently responsible advertising to irresponsible with the use of the illegal silencer on them. And the middle one is likely something that people might have seen a bit in the press because it's something that Bud Light has been quite heavily sanctioned for. Uh, they have a current promotion called Up For Whatever uh, and they have this tagline on their beer label that says that it's the perfect beer for removing no from your vocabulary for the night. Uh, I'm not quite sure who authorised that one but uh, it's, all of the labelling has now been I hope they had a good lawyer. So, uh, yeah, I think they've certainly, they've certainly got plenty of publicity for it so uh, that's been, been good for them. In terms of the actual social media alcohol rules, I'm not going to delve into these. I think they're worth looking at if you're doing any advertising on social media, whether it's in Australia or in the US or elsewhere. Every one of these websites has special alcohol specific guidelines. Facebook actually has a list of examples of this is okay, this is not okay, uh, which is helpful for both you and, and anybody doing any social media marketing for you. Uh, to take a look at. They address the same issues of not targeting minors, uh, you know, responsible consumption, health claims, uh, anything of that nature. Um, and that was all I had. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Um, I might bring James into the conversation here too. I, I'm sort of, the take out from that seems to be that you have to be very careful but you have to take great care with activities you're actually doing in the United States. Mm -hmm. There are still um, so you, you have to be aware of doing things that can be picked up because you're contravening specific laws, but generally because Facebook and whatever social media outlets are global, you can't be expected to not be doing certain things. Would it also apply to, so if there was a, a generic advertisement that was acceptable here in Australia but was not acceptable in America, that's, well, America just has to accept that. Is that, is that, is that is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, I think that's right. I think I think they really do look at this idea of targeting, of just anything that's going up on your Facebook page. You know, you obviously can't restrict. You can, I think, geo restrict people from joining your social media feeds. You can prevent anybody in the U.S. from from joining your feed. But you know, I don't think that's something that, that that's necessary for anybody just with a general marketing program that isn't specifically looking at targeting the U.S. Uh, but you know, it, it, it seems to be an area where there isn't isn't much review of, of that. James, your thoughts on um, the material case just presented? Yeah, I think um, I agree with what Kate said. You, there's got to be an element of common sense in it uh, in terms of what you put on your um, whether it's a Facebook page or an Instagram account or whatever. Uh, if you're if you doing something in a more concerted way or as part of a campaign or a program, then it would be um, yeah, a good idea to look at those rules that each of the um, those different social media platforms has, depending on where what what um, what platform you're using. If you're doing it across multiple ones, then obviously that that's creating a little bit extra work for yourself. But um, I think you you look at the amount of effort that you're putting in and the amount of content that you're uploading and then the, the degree to which you do the research to check compliance is probably in, in, um, uh, you know, in proportion to, to how much you're actually engaging in. I mean, if, if it's one photo every six weeks, then um, you're hardly going to be made the target of, a, of some sort of a criminal investigation by the, the regulatory authorities in the US. I'm looking at the results of our second poll up on the screen now. It's not often you get a poll with a 100% <laughs> to one answer. Everybody managing it themselves from Australia. Is that, hang on, no, no, no. it's changed. One, one just changed. Decisions are being made on the run. Given what you've just been saying about on the ground American knowledge about the, 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 the importance of importers in all of this, is it something that companies should be looking to have their Facebook US stuff handled from the US rather than trying to do it from here? I don't think so necessarily. I think it's certainly worth talking to your US customers, talking to your importer and talking to your wholesalers about the markets that they deal with because every state is different. Uh, you know, we often tell clients actually exporting product into the US that you can't necessarily think of it as exporting to one country. It's almost like Europe. Um, there are 
blocks of states, but you know the U.S. market is essentially 50 different markets that you're shipping into. Each one has its own laws and regulations. So the more you can rely on your U.S. agents, uh, that that's certainly helpful, at least for some guidelines for what you're doing. But you're also going to find that. U.S. distributors in particular are really going to want you to be doing a lot of advertising yourselves as well. So it's something where I think it's helpful to get guidance from them, but you know you are going to be expected to, to do some promotion uh, to U.S. customers as well by, by your distributors. James, you, you work in the wine industry here. Are you getting people coming to you asking questions around social media and, and Facebook, either specific questions or because they do consider it a slightly intimidating area? Uh, I'd love to say yes, but usually people only come to their lawyer when um, something goes wrong uh, rather than when they're looking at, at um, being ahead of the curve and saying, oh, yeah, maybe I should get some advice on this. So the answer is uh, no. Um, people come when, when there's a problem. So I've got one at the moment where um, a, some sort of a weirdo has taken the, the name and logo of a client and used that as their Facebook page, um, as their, um, their name and their, their image. <laughs> so that, that's, that's normally when people come along rather than sort of um, because they're, they're looking at, at, at doing something. And it's, and it's entirely understandable. Any sort of advertising or marketing, it's not you don't generally go and, and seek legal advice. It's really only the, the bigger companies and they've probably got their own in-house people who are going to be advising on that anyway. Um, coming back to what Kate was saying, um, I think the, the, from, a, from a legal perspective, the key would be to have in your distribution agreement um, or your importer agreement, whatever agreement you have with the, the guys in the States, a clear... Um, statement of whose responsibility the various elements are. So if you are getting your, um, say, if you, if you were going to have a, a separate um, US Facebook page set up that, that targets US um, markets um, and is, is compliant with US laws, then you need to make it clear if the distributor is responsible for that and have some form of you know, indemnity or, or, or very specific uh, identification of whose responsibilities are which. Um, and I think coming back to one of the comments we had there from, from Phil earlier about you know, how much, um, how likely are you to be held responsible, I think as Phil says in his comment, it, it is a matter of sense, uh, of common sense and I think a matter of um, proportion too. You know, to what extent are you uh, pushing it, are you um, driving traffic to the promotion, um, are you, you know, what sort of, if, if you're offering, you know, some sort of a prize, you know, is it, is it 25 bucks worth of prizes, is it $25,000 worth of prizes? It, the, I think it's very the, much the what powers, yeah. Yeah. Thank, James, we have, to, we have to wrap up now. We're about to lose our line. Thank you to you. Thank you to you, Kate, very much both for your input. I hope people found that uh, valuable. Three very quick bits of promotion before I go. WCA's Consumer Insights events have been moved a little later in the month of June, uh, 15th in Sydney, 16th in Adelaide and the 18th in Melbourne. Please uh, register for them if you're interested in getting the very latest information. Well, our next webinar is on July the 7th. Registrations are open for that one, looking at wine clubs. Um, so please uh, get on and get involved with that one. And uh, finally, as we wrap up from this, uh, we'll have an exit survey. We'd um, love to hear your thoughts. Um, so once again, thank you to, to Kate and James for that. I hope it was valuable and I look forward to welcoming you to our next webinar very, very soon. Thank you all. <laughs>